Good to be back here again. I was here once before, and uh, now I'm bringing with me a colleague, James Cernkovich, um, a photographer for many years. His first book is called Authentic America, the Art of Social Documentary. Basically, a lot of street photography with heart and conscience. And his second book, which has just come out now, and that's why we're here, is called James Serkovich's Atomic America. Notice the two covers. It's a diptych. <laughs> Soon to be a trilogy, maybe. <coughs> so James specializes in the Cold War and the cultural response to the presence of the bomb all over the United States. He says he was influenced by my work at work in the fields of the bomb, where I've got inside uh, about half of the bomb factories. And James wasn't able to figure out how to do that, so he photographed the cultural response in communities all over America. So it's really complementary work. So I, in this book, James asked me to include an afterword. So we have all of his photographs here. And then in the back, he wanted me to include a series of my photographs under the title on nuclear seeing. So uh, it, it's to put his work in a broader context. And uh, so I, I've done that. And normally when I introduce James, I would summarize my afterword. But because this is a series on Rocky Flats, I, I was convinced that the people coming today would be expecting to hear something on Rocky Flats, as is only <laughs> right to assume. And so I have <coughs> adapted my topic. I've made it Rocky flats centric um, And so uh, it still gives a context for what James will be talking about at the Cold War, but it's more about Rocky Flats than appears in his book. The story of Rocky Flats is not a happy one. A decade of scandalous calamities with people and fire and water and earth and air. Calamities wrapped in denial, sealed with a gag order and served up hot and numb to all comers. One thing we know about Rocky Flats for sure is that from 1952 to 1989, it made 70,000 plutonium pits for the bomb. That comes out to five pits a day, seven days a week, for 37 years. One other thing we know uh, about Rocky Flats and its pits is we know what these products can do. A pit can break the strong bonds within atoms and release a kind of energy not of this earth. It's an energy we used to find only inside stars. Until, that is, we brought it down to earth. This is the Hiroshima mushroom cloud. And you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Winning wars, saving lives, <coughs> and all that. But not to Albert Einstein, who enunciated what I'm going to call the first law of the bomb. He said, nine months after Hiroshima, the unleashed power of the atom has changed everything except our mode of thinking, and therefore we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. I found what I would call the second law of the bomb when I went to Hiroshima. This is the A-bomb dome on the river Ota, right under ground zero. It didn't get destroyed because the bomb exploded directly overhead, so the pressures on it on all sides were equal. So it kind of shored up that one building, which looks like a rusty razor blade. And it's now the, the symbol of that what happened to that city. The survivors of Hiroshima 
<coughs> who are called hibakasha, which means explosion affected persons, or those who have received the bomb. They are the ones who told me three things when I went there. This is a model uh, of the city of Hiroshima. You see it's ringed around by mountains, and you see that red dot on the, in the middle there, that's the height at which the bomb exploded. It didn't go off in, in the ground like most bombs do because they wanted maximum effect of the heat and the blast and the pressure and the radiation. And because it's ringed around by mountains, the blast effect hit the city, went out to the mountains, and bounced off the mountains and came back to the city again, flattening everything. And most of the buildings were of wood, so that quickly became a conflagration that burned the city to the ground. So here's the three things that the Hibakusha told me when I asked them about the bomb. Number one, if you weren't there when it happened, you can have no idea what it was like. Because it wasn't like a regular bomb in any sense. Number two, this must never happen again to anyone for any reason. Nothing justifies the indiscriminate annihilation of a whole bunch of people. And the third thing they told me, what I'm going to refer to as the second law of the bomb, <coughs> is that nuclear weapons and human beings cannot coexist. And yet, coexist we do in spades. We have, we do, and we will coexist with nuclear weapons. So, are the Hibaksha wrong? Well, I think what they're telling us is that as long as we reserve the right to hold tight to the power to annihilate a group of people or a nation that we do not agree with, by that measure, we have lost our humanity. We have lost the very qualities that we're proud to say make us human. The Earth can't tolerate a bunch of guys walking around with exploding A-bombs in their chests. Here is the face of the Cold War, our adversary. This is Yuli B. Karitan. He made the first atomic bomb based on designs from the spy Klaus Wüth that he stole from Los Alamos. He also founded the Soviet nuclear weapons design lab, Arzma 16, and he ruled over it for 40 years. And with Sakharov and Zeldovich, he was the inventor of the Soviet H-bomb. He was thrice decorated by Stalin as a hero of Soviet labor. What disturbs me most about this portrait that I got of him is the little Mona Lisa smile on his face. Thank you very much. <laughs> but the enmity that we felt with him, an enmity that went deeper than death, and it promised to last forever, as we all know, suddenly it vanished. So some people thought, well, the enemy is gone. Maybe the bomb will go too. But the bomb remained. It had an ace up its sleeve. And when it played this card, it gave us the third law of the bomb. It goes something like this. I am the Lord thy bomb. I will be with you forever, because now you no longer need an enemy to have a bomb. When the bomb became a symbol of our national identity and our sovereignty, I think it entered our DNA. And the fourth law of the bomb is that the bomb is not just a symbol. The bomb has grit. And it's not a symbol thing. Its grit is deadly and it's virtually everlasting. And it's a shape-shifting grit. Very tricky stuff. And it comes from uranium. This is a particle of uranium in a cloud chamber. So every bit of uh, radioactivity that comes off of it, it leaves a trace. 
in the in the fluid. Uh, and it's a shape shifter in three ways. This uranium, which is the mother element, by the way, of all nuclear weapons. There's no nuclear weapon that doesn't originate in uranium. The first way it's a shape shifter is it's naturally natural radioactivity. It's constantly throwing off particles and turning into a dozen different elements. Some with half-lives of one one-thousandth of a second, others with half-lives that last 70,000 years. So that's the nature of uranium, is to do that. But there's another way that it's a shapeshifter, and that's by reason of fission. The uranium is very rare. Its atoms can be split apart. In Chelyabinsk, this is a monument to the splitting of the atom. They really know how to make big monuments in the Soviet Union. And here we see Igor Korchatov, who was like the Oppenheimer for the Soviet bomb. And behind him, we see two hemispheres, which represents an atom being broken or split. And the curves around it represent the waves of energy that are released when you split an atom. <coughs> so you multiply that a trillion fold and you get a significant uh, explosion. But what I also like about this picture is that those two hemispheres will fall to the ground. That's fallout. That's what causes all of those problems. And when an atom splits, it doesn't split 50-50 every way. It can split in thousands of different ratios. 1 to 99, 49 to 51, you name it. The possibilities are nearly endless. And every one of those is either a different isotope or a different element with its own half-life that itself is a shape shifter. So that's the second way that uranium is shifty. And the third way is that uh, uranium can be transformed into plutonium. You irradiate uh, nuclear fuel, uh, uh, uranium-238, natural uranium, you, you uh, shoot uh, uh, neutrons at it, and when U-238 absorbs a neutron, it eventually becomes plutonium-239. And that's how plutonium is made. So, that brings us back to Rocky Flats. And we're going to talk about Rocky Flats, not because of the explosive power of its plutonium pits, the strong force. No, we're going to talk about it because of the weak force, which is another name for the radioactivity that comes off the different particles of radioactive materials, specifically plutonium. This is a shot that I took through a microscope at 300 magnification of a particle of plutonium in the lung tissue of an ape. And the industry will always tell you that plutonium is an alpha emitter non-penetrating radiation so it doesn't go very far, a piece of paper can stop it, but if you inhale it into your lungs, there's no barrier between the radiation that that's giving off and the 10,000 cells within its small but spiky radius. So it delivers a hefty dose. Even though the particle is so small, you cannot see it. It's, we're not even able to see it there. That's what we're going to talk about when we talk about Rocky Flats now, because Rocky Flats ended its career of, of making pits for the bomb in 1989, after it was invaded by the FBI. And that's when its mission changed from production of pits to cleanup. So I was there when that happened. It says, make it safe, clean it up, close it down. So in 1995, the DOE estimated that it would take 70 years and cost $36 billion to clean up the site because there was a lot of plutonium particles all over the place. But seven years later, DOE revised its plan downward. So instead of 70 years, they thought they could do it in three years. And instead of costing, 70, uh, instead of costing $36 billion, they said they could do it at uh, 10 times less the price. So that's what they did, an accelerated <coughs> cleanup. And the result is that the plutonium that had been measured and tracked by Carl Johnson in the early 80s and by Cray and Hardy or before him in the 70s, two sets of uh, numbers that matched pretty closely, that all of that was unchanged after the cleanup. They didn't go into that and clean that up. 
What we're seeing here are three red zones. The reddest one, dead center, is zone one. And in that area, cancers uh, among people living there, working there, are 16% higher than normal. In the second zone, the cancers are 10% higher. And in the third zone, which reaches into Denver, the cancers are 6% higher than normal. Now, you can't always say this cancer was caused by that exposure. Nevertheless, there's a broad area there where it uh, looks very likely. So, because all that plutonium is still there and all that dirt, that raises certain issues with uh, people who want to do things with that dirt, like Leroy Moore, for example, who would want to take a walk out into that area during a high windstorm. Uh, you can bet that those clouds are not clean. It also affects people who want to build homes in that region. This is in the southeast corner of it right in that red zone. So we have the Candelis development and Whisper Creek development where homes go for $300,000 and the dirt uh, is without a price. But all that dirt is bound to have plutonium in it. We don't know how much because they're not actually measuring it, but it's out of that red zone. So it gives us plenty of room for thought. So here's our flags flapping in the breeze, welcoming people to Candelis. I think their motto should be something like, uh, have a nice 250,000 years, because that's the life of plutonium that you have to pay attention to. I said fire, water, earth, and air. We looked at the earth. We looked at the air with the wind. Let's look at water and fire. A few years ago, there was a huge flood that sent sheets of water across the contaminated landscape of Rocky Flats. And the water moved so fast, and it was so unusual, the flood, that they did not have machines that could monitor it. So they had no idea of what uh, went off the land. Uh, but there is the high water mark. There's the culvert that, that pours the water off-site into the, the south and southern areas towards Denver. And the water was, was that much higher. That's Leroy Moore again, mucking about in the uh, post-apocalyptic era of that flood. So it was a huge amount of water and no doubt a very large amount of plutonium particles, too small to see. And no man can say how much got out. So let's talk about fire too. And I don't mean the two huge industrial fires early on in Rocky Flats life, some of them, one of them the most expensive industrial fire in the history of this nation. But no, let's talk about a brand new fire. The fire of the land ceded to the fish and wildlife. Uh, I like to call it fish and wildlife, um, w which wants to keep its grasses uh, native and pure. So they're going to do a little ethnic cleansing of these grasses by burning them <coughs> down to get rid of the invasive species. Now since they are growing in the red hot area, it's very safe to assume that they would uptake plutonium particles. Equally safe to assume that if you burn it, the smoke would be carrying plutonium on the winds and it would be inhaled by people. So Leroy and his people have been fighting that burn and they've succeeded in having them admit that they won't do the burn on schedule just yet. So Leroy is now pushing for a, a permanent ban on the burn. So what to do about all of this? Well, I like to think, you know, Einstein said we have to change our mode of thinking. And I don't think he meant that we have to understand the deep mystical nature of reality to do that. I think he meant a couple of very basic things, one of which I would say applies to this picture of a young fourth grader in Three Mile Island. The People of Three Mile Island was my first book and I photographed the people there for a year. And when I got this picture I realized that this accident, this meltdown in southern Pennsylvania, it, it didn't happen to them. It happened to us. This is us. And then I got this other picture in Chelyabinsk 
of the Maids of Muslimovo, a little village 35 kilometers downstream from the plant that made the plutonium for the first Soviet weapons. And what they're looking at are the first Westerners they've ever seen uh, measuring the radiation in the river that flows past their town because for four years, in the, er in the middle 40s, the Soviets were in such a rush to make their bombs that they dumped high-level nuclear waste from plutonium reprocessing into the river. And the waters turned black and people fell ill and many people died. And the doctors were ordered not to ever use the word radiation. You tell these people that they have vegetative syndrome. So they're beginning to realize for the first time uh, the, 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 the nature of the terrible calamities that had happened to the health of the people in their area. Now, what I like about the picture is that they're taking it in. Their eyes are open. They're very concerned. They are not in a state of denial. And I think that's <coughs> step number one to uh, a, a new mode of thinking about the nature of the bomb is to look at it square on. And here's another picture that takes it a bit further. This I took uh, at the Uranium Film Festival in Quebec City where they had certain displays and one was a, a pyramid of drums with radioactive symbols on them and uh, the Cree nation had funded this, uh, this film conference and they showed all kinds of films about uranium and nuclear things. And the Grand Chief of the Cree is called Matthew Kuhncom. And he's totally opposed to uranium mining on Cree lands, which are extensive in northern Quebec. And there was Matthew right there. So I asked him if he wouldn't mind, you know, standing next to the drums. And he didn't mind. So I got this picture of him. And when I looked at the picture later, I looked at his expression and I could see this is an amazing relationship to this stuff. He's not angry. Uh, he's not frustrated. He's not disempowered. He's taking it in. And a week before that, I went to a hearing where he was giving his opinions to the government bodies. And he said, and saying not to have mining on their lands. And he said, you know, the Cree, we do not own this land. We do not use this land. We are this land. And to me, that's the beginning of the new mode of thinking. And I will conclude with my last picture, it's a graphic, of, of what I think is an embodiment of what it takes to have that new mode of thinking, is you become the problem. You look at it, this is our problem, you breathe it in, and you exhale something like the will to make it all somehow better than you found it. So, that's what I wanted to tell you today, and I uh, hope that gives a background to my colleague, James. I love to photograph all the stuff around the atomic bomb. <coughs> so when I went to the Atomic Museum in Albuquerque, I immediately noticed the missile in front and thought, what can I add to that image to give that missile a sense of place? Then, I noticed the statue of the conquistadors across the street at the Museum of Natural History. I thought, why not combine two warring cultures? As I walked around the statue, I noticed a position that allowed me to visually put the middle right between the two conquistadors. So it gave the impression that one imperialistic culture just discovered its match, another imperialistic culture that uses its nuclear bomb as its weapon of choice. From day one of the atomic age, New Mexico has been the home of the atomic bomb. A lot of people are opposed to nuclear testing. I was lucky to be at the Nevada test site when Uncle Sam showed up. Even he was afraid of the presence of military authority. He would walk up to the front entrance, straddling the space, but not physically touching the forbidden side. Another Sam was Sam Day, the publisher of the Progressive Magazine who wrote a book in the 1980s called Nuclear Heartland. In it, he pinpointed the location of every nuclear missile in the United States. He was arrested for trespassing. He is dressed as a clown because he considered nuclear weapons a joke, a very bad joke. Planes from the 28th Refueling Squadron located near Mount Rushmore 
at Ellsworth Air Force Base could increase the range and flexibility of nuclear bombers by adding fuel and flight. I used to fly those. Oh, wow. Okay. A group of genies are represented as macho, super confident, all powerful, symbols of the power of the atom. They grant wishes and obey commands of their master. They appear in the film from the 1960s called The Age of the Atom. It is shown continuously at the Nevada Test Site Museum in Las Vegas. In Richland, Washington, near the Hanford Nuclear Reservation where plutonium was made, this church depicts a powerful, devoted family headed to a promised land through a field of radioactivity. <laughs> An exhibition called Building Atomic Vegas showed the influence of symbols of the atomic bomb on architecture and design. One such example is the Landmark Hotel, which mimics an exploding mushroom cloud. It was not unusual for some members of a family to work in the Nevada test site, and others might work in the casinos. In Pasco, Washington, Near the Hanford Reservation, different businesses incorporated the atomic theme, including this grocery store and this laundromat that would cater to the shopping needs of the nuclear industry workers. In nearby Richland, Washington, the team adopted the nickname the Bombers and the iconic mushroom cloud along with it, which was displayed throughout the school, including above the guidance counselor's office. It created controversy, but the symbol has endured. Side by side, Pershing, uh, the Pershing II and the SS-20, the U.S. and its uh, Soviet equivalent, uh, mark the first time that both of these are together. Before that, they represented opposing sides. In Conrad, Montana, monoliths rise from an uncompleted missile tracking radar facility. Construction was halted because the missile capabilities outstripped the technology it was designed for. Although the U.S. was the first to develop multiple warhead missiles, the Soviets soon copied it and made the radar facility <coughs> with its field of 100 protective missiles around it obsolete. Because the missiles could splinter off in different directions, completely overwhelming the security that had been developed. In Nakoma, North Dakota, this radar facility was finished and looks like a frog. After a cost of $6 billion to build, it was active for only a couple days and then abandoned. A Hutterite community uh, recently bought it for $540,000. Let's step back for a minute uh, to the first atomic blast, the Trinity site in Albagorda, New Mexico. Sand fused by the force of the atomic blast created Trinitite. There, held in the hand. People want to make a physical connection with objects of great power. Here, a woman puts her hand against the front casing of a replica of the Nagasaki bomb fat man. A religious community in Montana, Claire Prophet's Church, Universal and Triumphant, believed in a survivable nuclear Armageddon. To build homes on church property, members agreed to build a fallout shelter. This entrance to a community fallout shelter has 13 units. It starts with a decontamination shower on the uh, right side, then you go through a coffin. At the end, uh, it branches off into an egg-shaped junction where members could begin a new life. This book is filled with captions. At this time, let me introduce you to one written from, uh, for the entrance to the underground elementary school in Artesia, New Mexico. Steel Salvation. This portal, weighing in at 1,800 pounds, stands ready to allow access to citizens fleeing fireballs and fallout. After 2,160 of the saved have crossed the threshold into the shelter, this door and two others like it get bolted shut as atomic dramas of destruction, salvation, and remorse play out in this village of 20,000 souls. <clears throat> At the high school across town in Artesia, New Mexico, from the underground elementary school, 30-year-old Candy is pulled from a civil defense canister and offered to visitors. 
The caption goes like this, imagining in the future, a young American, proud of his country's deterrent posture, fondles a forward film of a tactical nuclear missile while peering into the distance, confident that the U.S. nuclear arsenal keeps his country safe. Ellsworth Air Force Base, Rapid City, South Dakota. And on the facing page, remembering Hiroshima, a young American honors the victims of the Hiroshima atomic bomb by gathering around himself 1,000 paper cranes on the 42nd anniversary of the bombing of the dropping of the bomb. 1,000 paper cranes have long been a symbol of Sadaka Sasaki's hope against hope in the nuclear age. Seattle, Washington, August 6, 1987. My work documents the Cold War, but it's not over. Our president recently authorized one trillion dollars over 30 years to upgrade our, web, our nuclear arsenal. The Russians, late last year, successfully launched a sub-based ICBM that hit its target. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Well, the the dirt. there are two things they could have done. One is they could have cleaned the site to try to remove as much of the contamination, primarily plutonium particles, very tiny plutonium particles, as Harvey Nichols found in his research in the mid-1970s, <coughs> and scattered in all over the site, they could have cleaned as much of that as they possibly could with the existing technology. You mean carry away dirt? Take right. it away, right. right. Take it somewhere. They did take stuff to, they buried waste at the Nevada test site, they took it to a uh, a place in Utah, not west, about 60 miles west of Salt Lake City, where they, where they deposited uh, did, a did nuclear they, waste. So, would they have to? Yeah, did, how much soil did they take off? Well, let let me finish. So, one choice would have been to clean the site as thoroughly as possible, and the other choice is to, no, let's not do that. Let's clean it. To, let's decide on an amount, and let's uh, let's write that into the law. And let's clean it up according to uh, our, our agreement between the De Department of Energy, the EPA, and the state government. And if we can get those three parties to agree, never mind what the public wants, let's, let's establish a legal standard for the cleanup and let's clean it to that level. That's what they did at Rocky Flats. And the cleanup actually had three different levels for plutonium. Top three feet, very little. Second, between three and six feet beneath the surface, more plutonium. Below six feet, no limit at all. And, and there, there's a former Rocky Flats worker who insists that they buried stuff as much as 60 feet under the ground, and it is still there. And there were buildings that were taken down that, to levels below six feet and then covered over with dirt, so that stuff is still there. And it's going to be there, from a human perspective, essentially forever. So that's the cleanup we got. It's not very good, in my opinion, and, it, and it's, it's a risk.